Lisa, Jeremy, thank you so much for being with us to talk a little bit about balancing environmental stewardship with economic growth. I want to start with you, uh, Jeremy, if I might. In our focus groups across the region, we heard several people talk about the importance of forest and trails and water and made clear that these represent important infrastructures for this region. Indeed, people said it was important to invest in them in the way that one might invest in roads, bridges, water and sewer systems. Can you talk a little bit about the complex collaborative process in place to ensure these investments are made? I can definitely do that. Um, being a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and working for the Eastern Band, um, being a federally recognized tribe, we have uh, limitless, um, um, we've, we've experienced limitless exercises in creating those partnerships with federal, state, um, uh, county, uh, intertribal, those types of relationships. We realized something that in doing so, in those partnerships that we have, um, in, in doing so, we have understand that those, those relationships have to, have to be fluid. Uh, there has to be a confluence of, of ideas and resources. We've realized that. And to continue um, to bolster those types of things, um, communication is obviously key with everyone, and you have to be upfront with, with everything. And um, one of the perfect examples that I have in terms of some of the partnerships that we have, we have had with uh, Jackson County, for one, when um, building infrastructure an infrastructure project with Jackson County uh, Schools for Smoky Mountain Elementary. Mm -hmm. uh, the tribe partnered with Jackson County to fund that that project, and it's a uh, it's we have benefit from it. The tribe has benefit from it, and the schools have benefit and from it. And what is the project? The project is water to uh -huh. the uh, Smoky Mountain Elementary School. Uh, we are we are giving clean, good water. It can also provide proper fire um, fire protection. But then again, too, we have another customer. And then also down that line, down that 441 corridor, we don't have to waste water. Um, those types of relationships, that's just an example, those types of relationships are, are very important for us to make sure that we can, um, uh, those things can be carried over into a recreational uh, idea uh, with the properties that we've purchased at Black Rock and in Shut-In Creek. Um, there's no reason why we can't partner with in, in terms of that to create a recreational opportunity for the region itself. You never know when you get everybody down in the, uh, you get, bring everybody to the planning table, um, you never know where you can go. That, isn't that the so truth, that's always? True. Absolutely. So, and, Barry, I used to think that love it to death was a tagline from really bad movies. <laughs> You know, the kind that come on at 2 o'clock in the morning and somebody's killing somebody. But in this region, loving it to death takes on its own definition. Lots of conversations about how important it is to steward the natural assets that are at the very base of this economic expansion. Give us some sense of how that's playing itself out. So yeah, absolutely. So I don't. I think we may have coined that "loving it to death" because uh, of the number of users that visit our national forest. Um, so specifically around you know partnerships and and you know our agency is essentially f founded on that. We have a long history of partnerships here in the national forest in North Carolina, specifically the Pisgah and the Nantahala, which we'll be talking about today. And uh, we thrive on those partnerships and that shared stewardship model that we've been talking about with Lisa and Jeremy in the, in the panel prior. Um, but loving it to death does draw some concern uh, to our agency because uh, those impacts uh, from those users, some 7 million users visit the National Forest, the Pisgah and the Nantahala, every single year. That, say that, say that again. 7 million users. Wow. Um, that's second uh, to uh, only another national forest that uses skiing to get a higher number. <laughs> so we're one of the most visited national forests in America. Uh, so how we balance uh, through shared stewardship with our partners and volunteers is, is, is complex and challenging. 
So I want you to talk a little bit about the role of volunteers, because as we think about stewardship, one of the challenges are the limited resources that we might have at our disposal. But apparently there are no limits to the number of volunteers that you have at your disposal. A absolutely. So, um, yeah, we're, again, we're, you know, our background and our foundation is on partnerships. And, and specifically the volunteers that also uh, come to this area to retire and use these national forests. Uh, we couldn't do it without them, to be honest with you. Uh, and, and so um, we have uh, partnerships uh, with the Pisgah Conservancy on the Pisgah that essentially rounds up um, special projects that we outline and focus on. Uh, and it's even infrastructure and the critical infrastructure that serves our recreation users. And the Pisgah Conservancy, a nonprofit th that's really representing all the user groups from mountain biking, as we saw on the, on the video, uh, to equestrian users that's using our national forest. And on one day and one event, we're seeing as much as 350 volunteers coming to, to devote their time, wow. effort, and money for protecting our national forest lands. That's impressive. That's What's also humbling is that on any given day, on the Pisgah National Forest, on the Pisgah Ranger District, there's more volunteers working today than there are federal employees serving their job. Pretty impressive and humbling for me to say. That's remarkable. Lisa, yes. I want your take on this loving it to death <laughs> phenomenon. That's that's a good question, and I'll take it back to the reservoirs that we have in our area because we have access areas there. And so there's sometimes a perception in, in the Nantahala area, the Duke Energy Service area here, that our reservoirs are um, overused. Um, it, it, arguments could be made one way or the other, but Duke conducts capacity studies to see if our reservoirs can contain and maintain. There is high usage on Memorial Day weekend, and upcoming is the 4th of July, and it's, there's gonna be a lot of activity there. And as an example, up on Lake Glenville, they have an annual fireworks display that draws people on the reservoir, on their boats to see it, but also land-based. And so you have a lot of uh, concentration there of people loving it to death, but only for a short period of time. And I would be remiss if I don't make this point with this audience and representing Western North Carolina that another thing that Duke did in partnership is we developed access points on the mainstream of the, uh, the Tuckasegee River, which makes it the most accessible river in the southeast, southeastern United States. So that's really huge. So people ask, well, what about the use there? To date, we haven't seen overuse of the access points, but it's also limited to a certain degree because they're not very large. So that does a little bit of control mm -hmm. of um, use of those facilities. But one could see it being loved to death. Another thing for our reservoirs in the Nantahala area is that Duke owns generally 10 vertical feet above full pond. And so adjoining property owners have to ask for, for permission for what they can do on that tract of land. So we do control and steward that section of property that surrounds our reservoirs. So we can control a little bit to a certain degree how much it is loved. But we don't have a lot of control Beyond above that. our, yes. So I want to move from the focus on the natural assets themselves more broadly to look at public infrastructure. So having seven million people a year coming to visit the forest and however many more are coming for um, kayaking and taking advantage of the opportunities of these reservoirs has to have some impact on public infrastructure. Can we talk a little bit about what that looks like? I'll go. Go. Um, it has to, in your planning phase, it has to take, it has to take a central role from the very, very beginning. Um, if you're gonna do a project, if you're gonna do a capital project, if you're gonna build a hotel, if you're gonna build anything, you have to make sure you can flush the commodes, somebody's gonna take the trash out, and somebody is going, and you're gonna have fresh water. Those types of things have to be, from the very, very, very beginning, they have to be taken into account. We at the tribe, we've done a lot of uh, capital projects over the years, and we have, Learn the hard way. 
in many regards, but we're learning nonetheless. Um, for our latest project, the uh, our, our recreation project, uh, Fire Mountain Trails, we had just another example. We had an exercise that took place. It was a, a downed rider extraction exercise type of thing, and so um, what we um, what we did was that the, you've got to think of infrastructure issues as um, EMS and fire as well. Now during that. Um, during that extraction exercise, it really, really took a lot of uh, resources away so that you didn't realize it until you were actually there right. that uh, all of the, if one, one rider's down in the woods about a mile up from the, in the woods, you have to, um, if anything else were to happen, all the resources we were using, the reaction times and the response times would have dropped tremendously. Now we're working on that problem. We're working on that solution with, you've got to look at staffing, you've got to look at your, uh, you've got to tighten up your, um, mutual aid compacts and covenants. Uh -huh. And so it has to be, nonetheless, it has to be thought of at the very beginning. So I'm hearing EMS, I'm hearing water, um, I'm hearing workforce, um, I'm hearing waste, other implications? Sure, for us on the National Forest, it's, it is challenging, right? Uh, you're looking at facilities that were designed in the 70s, maybe the early 80s. Uh, that we're seeing essentially probably 25% of the use that we're, we're seeing now. So if you're looking at the physical infrastructure, you know, it's that shared stewardship concept of really sharing the responsibility um, with our state agencies and our nonprofits alike. Uh, I'd like to name a couple, and we could talk all day about our partnerships here for the National Forest in North Carolina. But specifically, you know, the fact that you could that's talk right. all day. That's right. That's right. I'm it, not going to let you talk it, all day, but I'm glad that you could. And I could. <laughs> <laughs> and but specifically, the partnerships around maintaining the infrastructure. Yeah, everyone would love to donate and build a new facility, but getting, uh, you know, troops rallied around, if you will, maintaining the infrastructure, as mentioned earlier, is is complex and challenging. But with uh, a partnership with a state agency called the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission, we have a long history of partnering with managing wildlife and aquatics, but not so much on maintaining infrastructure such as roads. So over the last couple of years, we're excited to say that we're matching our investment into our transportation system, specifically here in Western North Carolina, dollar for dollar in that agency. That's super exciting for the National Forest in North Carolina. Also talking about infrastructure uh, and focusing in partnerships uh, around removing culverts that were actually installed many, many years ago on the road transportation system that oftentimes creates barriers to the aquatic habitat that are going and moving underneath our road system. So we've partnered with Trout Unlimited using citizen science, the volunteers that you talked about earlier that are essentially collecting data and building databases from federal, state, and nonprofit uh, collections of data to really remove culverts and allow aquatics to pass and to really provide that resilient transportation infrastructure that we're seeking in this Western North Carolina region. It's fantastic. Thoughts, Lisa? Yeah, sure. So, you know, with that, our infrastructure mainly is that of uh, power lines that are built overhead. So, um, keeping the vegetation managed within that corridor is important, important because we have to supply reliable, safe power to our customers. I would say sometimes maybe a challenge would be um, as our region continues to grow for us, it doesn't happen very often, but you may have someone that won't allow a uh, property owner upstream or beside them or near them right of way to get electricity. But we've been successful in getting those things through and settled. I would say also that we uh, partner with, Jeremy was talking about construction within the Kuala Boundary is, is huge. And we always partner with uh, developers and, and other individuals as we move through a process to provide support in what we can do to provide the infrastructure that we need to supply the customers. So our, our earlier conversation about the volume of people is reflected in the challenges to infrastructure feels inconsistent with all of the chatter around the nature deficit for our younger generations. What specifically are you doing and what are you seeing in terms of young people, children, 
taking advantage of these resources. Um, that is kind of a passion of, of mine, particularly in terms I of... I've given you a softball question. <laughs> you certainly have. Um, um, well, the Eastern Band, we, we know one thing. If we want to succeed in any of these outdoor recreation uh, ideas, you have to get families and children involved, and you have to progress them. You have to put the, start them young and get them outdoors and get them loving the outdoors and being responsible for the natural resources. Um, one of the, um, um, one of the, another thing we have, we face here and on the Koala boundary is a, is, is the original impetus rather for Fire Mountain Trails was to get kids active. Uh, obesity rates are incredibly high on the boundary. Uh, diabetes rates are incredibly high on the boundary. Um, what we want to do, the original impetus was to get those people, get people moving, give them another opportunity to get outside and do something other than say ball sports. Um, we don't have any, necessarily any solid data to say that it's happening, but I certainly have uh, anecdotal data. You see families on the trails now. You see um, enrolled members of the Eastern Band with their sons and their daughters and their, you see entire families that would never have done this otherwise. Um, it's, it's just been a really phenomenal experience to actually see them on the trail. And that leads into our next step. Our next step is not to create some big massive jump line on Fire Mountain Trails, but it's to create a, a more of a greenway, what we call a green trail, a easy trail, something yes. for progress, for, for, for progression. And families can do, um, um, they can be together. Uh -huh. More of that type of type of stuff. The Eastern Band has been very active in doing that sort of thing. Our Natural Resources Department has, uh, our Fisheries and Wildlife Management has, uh, we have a yearly Talking Leaves um, Trout Derby. Brings 2,000 kids and puts them in the water and puts them puts a, a, a fishing rod in their hands. 2,000 kids from the Koala Boundary? No, 2,000 kids from the region. Okay. And from, yeah, from this region. And uh, we, we have so many good partners that are taking, that, that puts so much time and effort, i.e. Uh, Nantahala area Sorba, they have put on bike rodeos, they have contributed to the Jackson County Greenway Kids Bike uh, Trail. They've partnered with us on numerous occasions. Uh, we have Swain County Schools and Cherokee, uh, Cherokee Central Schools. They are now, uh, have, they have bike clubs that are taking kids out, getting them outside. Um, there's just numerous avenues. And it looks like, from my perspective, in terms of getting kids engaged, it looks like our region is doing a fine job of doing that. So this is so important because you could see that the alternative could be true, where you have all of these families from outside of the region coming in to enjoy these resources. And for people who live here, there's not as much incentive to take advantage of them. So kudos to you all for making that a priority. I want to end where I started, which is on this notion of how heavily collaborative these processes must be. And I'm particularly interested in how you are engaging local residents in the decision making about expanding this industry sector. I'll take this lead on this one and we'll use the example as I've referenced a couple of times, the resources we have, the hydroelectric resources we have here, went through a relicensing process. And Duke chose to make it a stakeholder process where we engage, there's the um, Takasiji Corporative Stakeholder Team and there's the Nantahala Corporative Stakeholder Team. There were 17 members of the uh, Takasiji team, 21 members. And with that, you're bringing a lot of people to the table who have different interests, but yet we worked through this. It took over um, 9,000 people hours to come to settlement agreements for both of these hydroelectric operations that struck a balance between environmental needs, um, accessibility to our reservoirs, aesthetics, and, and continued generation with our hydro facilities. And I think that speaks quite highly. That group was consistent of federal and state and local agencies. It represented county and towns in our footprint. It also represented um, you know, non-government organizations, homeowners associations, 
I, the list goes on, sort of like at Academy Awards, you don't want to start singling anyone out because if you miss someone, you know, you're a bit on the spot. But the point being, it was a collaborative effort that brought a lot of people together. And the beautiful thing of it is, it came out with an agreement that went from local up to the government and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission appreciated that and put it in place. So in essence, these communities developed what we have in place and was supported by that. That's, that's fabulous. Um, the calibration of the process to get you to outcomes that everybody can buy into, yes. critically important yes. in just about every arena, but certainly where you're talking about natural assets that we all feel belong to all of us. That's correct. I want to open this up to audience questions, if I may. So. Hi, I teach here at Western Carolina University in the Parks and Recreation Management Program. I wanted to kind of focus on a little bit about the human infrastructure. And it is awesome that we have so many volunteers working in the National Forest. But we also train students to work in the National Forest, looking for those federally, those federal jobs. So what can we do to make sure that our students are not being pushed out of jobs because volunteers have them? How can we make sure that they're going to have jobs um, in the future? I love this question because it makes clear that for every pro, there is a con. Yeah. <laughs> Barry, do you have a response? So, so sure, absolutely. So of course, um, that's, that's that's complex and challenging or you wouldn't be answering that question as a faculty member here with Western Carolina University. And that's something that, that we uh, strive to balance each and every day. Um, but l let me talk specifically about what we are doing uh, to network with the universities and really influx as best that we possibly can students and, and, and recent graduates into our agency specifically to, to secure those federal jobs. Uh, we have partnerships with universities all across the country and specifically uh, we've worked with this university here and we have members of our staff in the engineering department that are graduates of Western Carolina University. Um, as Arthur and I was talking earlier, you know, when, when folks asked me about advice about working with the federal government, and, you know, get, just immerse yourself in that agency, into that department, in that culture uh, before you, you know, just kind of jump into it. So uh, we have opportunities here in North Carolina, uh, specifically Franklin and each of our district ranger offices. So if you would like to connect with me later on, there's numerous opportunities that we can plug your students in park and recreation into the National Forest in North Carolina. So I guess it would not be appropriate for me to ask for a cut of any student who actually gets a job <laughs> with the Forest Service. OK, there are limits to it all. I want to thank you all for engaging in this really rich conversation. And of course, thank you to the audience for being here. It is true that for as much good as is happening because of this boom to this incredible outdoor recreation industry, there are some challenges. There are present day challenges, and they certainly will be future ones. I'm happy to know that in this region, you are working together in such a wonderfully robust way to respond to those challenges. Thanks again. This is NC Impact.